All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Keep Middlesex Moving's podcast series. I'm Christina Fowler, and today our guest is Director of New Jersey Division of Highway and Traffic Safety, Eric Heitman. For those who are not familiar with KMM, we are the Transportation Management Association for Middlesex County. We work with employers, local and state government agencies to promote programs aimed at traffic mitigation, sustainability, and economic development. To learn more about us, please visit us at KMM.org or just shoot me a quick email. Before we begin today's podcast, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping details. To ask a question, please use the Q&A features on the bottom of your screen. Once we wrap up the podcast, I will share the questions. This podcast will be recorded and we can send it to you along with any other questions that have been answered at your request. This podcast will also be live on Facebook. Before we begin, let me introduce you to our host and KMM Executive Director, Bill Neary. Good morning. Thank you, Christina. Uh, yes, this podcast series, I think, has been very successful because it's opportunities that we've had, we didn't have in the past, to have some tremendous guests to talk about the things they're working on. And today is another one of these great guests, the Director of Highway Traffic Safety, Eric Heitman. Uh, I have Eric's bio but it was about four pages long and I figured we could do the entire podcast talking about that. But needless to say he had 25 years in the state police and I rose to the rank of major. Uh, Eric, I'd like to call you major, but I think it's okay to be informal today. Absolutely. Uh, part of that, he had 10 years with the, the fatal accident investigation unit of state police. And I think those are the type of things that really a groundwork in his commitment to safety for New Jersey residents and New Jersey drivers. So he's been working very diligently, putting the highway traffic safety back in front of a big priority for the state of New Jersey. Uh, one, without going through numbers and statistics, we find it disturbing that during the pandemic, there's been a serious reduction in traffic, but not a serious reduction in fatal crashes because we find with less traffic, people drive faster. So it's been a problem that we have to address. And I think thank some of the programs that Eric's been working on are definitely addressing this. It's not just a it's not just a matter of engineering. It's a matter of also convincing people how they have to do to drive safely. So Eric, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, Thanks, Bill. I guess Thanks. the first question is since I went over a little bit of your background, give us a little bit more insight about how this background is actually impacted to where you are today. Yeah. So uh, you know, I've always had a relationship with this office. Um, um, yeah, so toward the middle of my career, I spent 10 years in the state police's fatal accident unit and uh, had a big impact on me um, because you, you just continue to, to, to see the effects of, of uh, you know, improper driving and, and, and the effect of, of, of these crashes. And, you know, there's got to be something we can do about it. You know, there's got to be something we can do to prevent it. Um, you, you see the consequences. They're devastating. You know, the, the life-changing effects of, of traffic crashes are horrible. And, and the biggest point to make is that they're avoidable, you know? And, and so the goal of this office is, is zero fatalities. It is and always will be. Um, and that's our mission, you know, to try to find innovative ways to reduce crashes and fatalities. You know, we want everyone to get where they're going safely. Um, you know, we can prevent these crashes. We can prevent the cost of these crashes, the lost lives, the injuries damage and the monetary costs. And, and that's what we're here for. Well, I, I think that's some of the programs you're talking about specifically. I mean, highway traffic safety over the years had the click it or ticket campaign. And that took years of changing people's behavior. Right. Uh, now you really have an incredible high percentage of people who actually has to put their seatbelts on. I mean, I can't get out of my driveway without thinking my seatbelt has to be on because it's such a creature yeah. of habit there. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, that's an important thing to note is that, you know, that that's a behavioral change that's taken a long time and over years. But I mean, now it's it's very unusual to, to see someone or find some folks that are not wearing their uh, wearing their their belts. But unfortunately, you know, we see a, a large percentage of our fatalities. I, well, I shouldn't say a large percentage, but there is a percentage of our fatalities that are, are unbuckled. And, and I saw that when I was investigating crashes as well. And, and you'd you'd see crashes where you know, you didn't know for sure, but but it was a good chance if that person was belted, they would have lived, you know, and, and it's just such an avoidable tragedy. Um, so that's, you know, that's a huge part. You know, we, we need our drivers to buckle up and, and pay attention and, and drive deliberately. You and know? that's one of the things we've learned at, at KMM also is the backseat bullets, that people are pretty good to drivers and even front seat passengers 
are pretty good at putting their seatbelts on, not necessarily the people in the back seat. Right, right. We do a, you know, we, um, we do a seatbelt survey every year. It's required um, from NHTSA. Um, so, you know, we see the percentages and, and New Jersey has historically hovered around 94% compliance, uh, at least with front seat um, restraint. Uh, it's tough to do the survey. It's tough to, you know, to do an observational survey and see into the rear seats. Um, but, uh, you know, we're hoping to maintain and, and, and improve on that 94% um, uh, restraint usage um, because it's, it, you know, it's so important. Well, it saves lives. That's exactly. That's the mission. That's what exactly what it does. Uh, you have a new program with distracted driving too that you've been working on. Can you tell us about that? We do. So, uh, you know, in, in April to, uh, you know, we brought a, we brought a PR firm on board to carry out our, our major distracted driving crackdown for, for April this year. Um, you know, that'll coincide with NHTSA's distracted driving awareness, awareness month and the national you text, you drive, you pay mobilization. Um, so for this, for this year, we're putting a million dollars in enforcement grants out on the street and, and a half million dollars in, in paid media, uh, an awareness campaign. So that campaign is going to include a, a large six month, you know, media campaign, as well as a distracted driving enforcement mobilization. Um, the creative concept for the campaign is going to focus on a painted steering wheel which focuses, uh, which will showcase people's future aspirations. And the idea that, you know, all things are possible uh, as we remind people, you know, you have places to go, don't drive distracted, take control of your destiny, basically. Um, so the, the painted steering wheel creative will be carried across, you know, media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all of our, all of our social media channels, and um, as well as streaming audio. So people will see the ads on digital screens at grocery stores and at the rest stops on the Turnpike and Parkway and, and the AC Expressway. So that's that, that's the gist of the campaign. I mean, it's it's a huge it's a huge thing for us because again, as as we look at a data driven approach to reducing our crashes, it's important to know that 50% of all the crashes that occur in New Jersey are due to distracted driving. You know, that's the data we have, and it's it. It, that's a huge percentage of our crashes. So, um, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, well, we've learned that, you know, we always said at KMM, the, the, the three E's of safety are engineering, enforcement, education. So you're taking care of two of them right away, big time with the enforcement and the education piece. And I think that's going to really make right. an impact. Right. This is driving the, isn't just texting. Right. It's a, no, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different distraction and just, you know, it, just not paying attention is distraction, you know, and that, that's why I've said, it. you know, people need to drive deliberately, just try, you know, pay attention and just drive the car. It, it takes uh, enough attention just to do that. You know, you, you, you can't divide your attention when you're, when you're driving a car, especially in the kind of traffic that we have in New Jersey. And the speeds are moving it. I mean, you're distracted for a couple seconds. You're going to go the length of a couple football fields before you get your mind focused back on where you are. That's right. It That's doesn't right. Take much, and this isn't just the distracted driving programs are not just for teen driving. You do have a teen driving program you're working on, I know, but both of them are going to go hand in hand, I assume. They are. They are. We're not just focusing on our teen drivers with the distracted uh, campaign. I mean, it's it's everyone. Um, our our statistics show us that distraction occurs across you know every age group and 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 driver type. It's, you know, it, it goes across the board. Um, Younger drivers, though, are more susceptible to different types of distractions because of their inexperience. That's and true. And I always said that the probably one of the best things for a 19 or 18 year old is to have a fender bender right after they get their license because it well, faces reality real quick. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, when you mentioned teen drivers, I mean, that's one of the greatest success stories that we have in New Jersey is, is Kylie's Law and our graduated driver's license. Um, you know, that, that's, that's one of the programs that was put in place, you know, years ago that's really been a success. I mean, we've, we've, we've cut our teen driver tragedies in half um, or more, um, you know, since, since the beginning of our graduated driver's license. And, and we did a campaign uh, last year called Stick to It, 
Um, you can find that on our website. And we're going to continue to leverage that campaign. Uh, we launched that in September of 2020 uh, to educate parents and, and young drivers about our, honestly, our nationally acclaimed teen driver laws. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue to push that campaign and, and try to push it out to driver's ed classes also. Um, you know, Basically, so Kylie's law, Kylie's law is about the, the having uh, the hours your child can operate the car and those kind of things. Give me some correct and, about that law. And speaking of distra distractions, it's it's the passenger restrictions. You know, our, our new drivers can only have one passenger in the car, uh, period, unless they have a, a parent or guardian in the car with them, as well as the, um, you know, they're not allowed to have any electronic devices. They're not allowed to use even a hands hands free electronic device during their uh, probationary period. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a, we have a three tiered licensing process, you know, considered one of the most progressive and, and stringent um, across the country, but there's a reason for it because it works. And by working, it saves lives. That's, that's always the goal. And I think it's exactly. Tremendous. Exactly. Well, I know you're also involved very much with the state initiatives that they're working on for the, well, I've been at meetings where they've had 200 people taking this vision towards Vision Zero program to the next level. Uh, that's working with the DOT and with the various groups of people. Uh, in the TMA world of us, there's eight of us TMAs in the state. We've been getting support from your organization for years now about programs that we can work on together. So I think it's great. Right, right. Well, that's the mission. You know, and and you know whatever we can do to 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 reach that goal. Um, you know, I, I I think about the uh, the phrase "failure is not an option." You know, and that's not that's not just driving either. Highway traffic safety has to do with bicycles and pedestrians too, because those people share the road and they're part of the incidents that we have to worry about. Pedestrian crashes have been a serious incident uh, issue in uh, New Jersey for quite a while now, and they seem to right. be increasing more than going down. So, yeah, we 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 have an alarmingly high, you know percentage of pedestrian involvement in our fatalities it's you know it's it's plus or minus 30 percent um so like you said i mean we, we're partnering with our local tmas and uh, discussing you know implementing pedestrian safety programs in our top cities um as well as you know sustained year-long programs um in in the 20 yeah, you know, top 21 of 25 municipalities uh, f that are highest in pedestrian crashes. So, you know, overall, we're going to put about $15 million in programs and initiatives, uh, you know, to enhance traffic safety across the board. And, and a lot of that is geared toward pedestrians, um, you know, including our statewide mobilizations. We also have a pedestrian safety fund of, of state money um, that we, we, uh, we run out of this office. That's our pedestrian safety fund. Well, we're using so, your support in our hometown of East Brunswick here, in my hometown, to develop, a, we're having a committee working with the mayor to develop a safety town, which is a, a virtual, not, I shouldn't call it virtual, a replica of maybe a cityscape, which with, with sidewalks and, and crossing lights and those type of things to teach children from the very earliest ages, kindergarten up, about pedestrian and bicycle safety programs. So. Your support is going to make that possible for people from the whole region to be able to develop early safety habits, which is the best way to do things. Right. We right. all remember cross of the green, not in between. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Well, it's, uh, I, I think that's an incredible type of thing that people don't realize that highway traffic safety is involved in so many different things on a statewide level that actually is working down to the local level too. It's not just right. a state program. It, it, it brings it down to, like you said, the, the higher risk communities, the uh, the local towns where the, the local communities can see an issue that they have to face and they can work with you to try and solve a problem in their neighborhoods that people live in. I think it's great. Right. Like I said, I, I mean, I think I, I think you touched on it. You know, one of the important things for us is 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 this data driven methodology that we use. Um, you know, we, we've instituted a migration to a, really a, a totally data driven methodology for grant funding and for our programs, you know, such as targeting speed or driver distraction or seatbelt use, uh, impaired driving and so forth. Um, you know, in, in counties and municipalities rank statistically high for crashes in those 
factors. So we have a state-of-the-art web-based crash analysis tool that allows us to better analyze crash data and target our grant funding, you know, where it needs to go the most, where it's going to have the most impact. So we, we've also created a, a new class with, with Rutgers for our grantees um, that focuses on, you know, utilizing our, our crash analysis tool and, and grant writing. So we, we've invited... We've invited grantees from our, you know, most pro problematic areas. Uh, so we'll be looking, you know, uh, to, to, to assist them in, in applying for grants, you know, where we know that, you know, we need to put the money the most. Well, with this data, you can also determine most people have these crashes within a couple of miles of their house. I mean, obviously there's fatal crashes along the major highways. Statistically, I guess it's, it's bad because of speed. When you think the vehicle miles traveled on like the turnpike or the parkway compared to the number of crashes, it's actually relatively low. A lot of the crashes occur within a mile or two on county roads, state roads, you know, not even state roads, local roads where people get hit by cars or get, or get in crashes that cause serious injury or fatality. It and is. Adam, um, can point that. Right, right. And, and you bring up, you know, our highways, which is interesting. I'm, I'm very familiar with the Turnpike and Parkway. I spent a lot of my state police career there. And I mean, those roads are extremely safe, especially when you consider the uh, amount of traffic that they move. I think the Turnpike um, has one of the lowest fatality rates of any similar highway in the country. You know, so although you, you, you may hear about, you know, spectacular crashes that occur on those roads occasionally, um, you know, they are extremely safe. And the, the Turnpike Authority does a great job in, uh, in keeping it that way. Well, that's when you're talking about how transportation affects uh, economic development also. Uh, New Jersey's become a state for uh, logistics and uh, movement of goods and freight. And uh, that road, that Turnpike is going to be the artery that takes uh, so many trucks off our local roads and onto the major sources of, uh, of supplying, I guess the whole East Coast with merchandise that comes from uh, the rest of the world. It shows up at our ports in Newark and then goes distributed, redistributed throughout the, uh, the entire region. We have a, a very a state, densely populated reliable state. Reliable highway works, yep. Right, and, and a very dense, uh, you know, uh, traffic volume as well. Well, that, that's the dense traffic volume with the densest, the highest density state in America too, makes it a, right. makes it a challenge for you every day. It is a uh, challenge. <laughs> Well, tell us about, I'm sorry, we, we kind of got off stream about this, this state the committee that the state has. What's it called? The HPSTP? I can't remember the letters, but the one you were talking about earlier with the large number of people, the stakeholders involved in that obviously will take your message about moving towards zero fatalities in the right direction, I think, going into the right. future. And this is kind so of that, innovative. It is. Uh, that's the governor's hits pack committee, we call it. It's the Highway Traffic Safety Policy Advisory Committee. And uh, it's made up of, you know, a, a high level group of, of, of traffic safety um, uh, decision makers. Um, and it's there to, to basically, you know, uh, advise on, on policies and, and affecting traffic safety. Um, so we meet, you know, quarterly and, and discuss the, the, the ongoing uh, issues. I mean, one of the one of the big things that we're looking to get done um, this year again is 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 better traffic safety data. You know, the better data we have uh, to, to target our resources and our, and, and uh, you know, our work, the better. So, you know, we're looking to put in a, a resource center, um, you know, within the next year or so as part of our highway safety plan um, to, to combine uh, different, you know, data sets so that when we're searching crash data, we have, you know, violations data, we have volume data, we have injury data and so forth. You know, it's just going to make a more robust, uh, you know, way to search this. Won't it be helpful also for helping break down some of the uh, barriers with the home rule police departments too? When people have the opportunity to look at their neighboring towns, statistics and information, because the borders between New Jersey towns are invisible land that were created by farmers a hundred years ago. You know, going from one town to the next in New Jersey is not anything different. It's different than it's perhaps in the Midwest. And so having our police departments and the home rule police departments get that same kind of data, they can collaborate and collaborate a whole lot better, I would imagine. Right, right. 
and 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 uh, yeah, I should mention our our and you know our our crash data is available to our grantees. So any of these departments that that have grants with us have access to their their crash data if they don't have it locally. And that that'll make a difference in terms of what you're talking about enforcement. I mean, right. there, there's 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 one town that will definitely see that people coming from another town are causing some crashes and what they're doing, and we be on alert for that. It'd be much more safer for everybody that way. Yeah. And as we get more and more populations. <laughs> right. The, the, right. The, you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, I, uh, I remember Yogi Berra said about that restaurant, nobody goes there, it's too crowded. Okay, and I think that's New Jersey. Nobody lives in New Jersey, it's too crowded, you know. And, I, and we're still a popular <laughs> state to move to and popular place to live in. So I think we can make it yeah. safer, it's all good for everybody. So what else, what other kind of program? You have anything else you're working on you think we can really add to the, uh, uh, the program for ideas and suggestions on people should do? If distracted driving is one of the issues, impaired driving has got to be another one. Impaired driving is huge. Um, impaired driving accounts for 20 to 25 percent of our fatalities every year, and that hasn't changed. And, uh, you know, we're in the process also, you know, we have so much going on, but we're in the process of formulating the first New Jersey Impaired Driving Task Force uh, to look at the best ways to utilize our resources to combat impaired driving. Um, you know, there's been a lot of awareness over the years. We, we have two mobilizations every year for drive sober or get pulled over. Um, you know, one part of this task force is that our law enforcement liaisons are reaching out to our, our chiefs, our state chiefs, um, to look into their individual agencies, DWI cases, and see, you know, where we can help to address any deficiencies or, you know, in, in the successful identification or prosecution of our drunk drivers. And when I say drunk drivers, it's, you know, it's drunk and impaired drivers. Well, impaired you know, means uh, marijuana legalization puts another challenge in your in your bookmark. I'm sure you have to worry. It about is that. a challenge, and drugs have been a challenge for a long time. And and when we talk about drugs, we're not just talking about um, illegal drugs. We're talking about prescription drugs. You know, there's there's a lot of prescription drugs out there that you should not be operating a car while you're you know you're taking. So, mm -hmm. um, you know. Again, historically, 25% of our fatalities involve drugs or alcohol. Um, but it, you know, when, when you translate that to our regular crashes, we have about 300,000 or so you know, reported crashes in New Jersey every year. Those crash records with regard to impairment are problematic due to the lack of testing. You know, recent NHTSA analysis um, that I just saw the other day showed us that about 65% of drivers in trauma centers after serious crashes tested positive for drugs or alcohol. Well, so one that's of, the things, a, of course, these people who are impaired are not the young drivers necessarily either. They're, a lot of them are the older drivers who are taking prescription medications and their, their reaction time, their eyesight, their, their, their hearing, everything else has been impaired beyond just the drugs. So now their, their older drivers are out there on the road with the, the prescription medicine affecting their, their whole ability to, uh, to drive a car. And that's, you know, it's not, sure. it's not necessarily a distraction as much as they may not be aware of it themselves. Right. Prescription drugs are definitely a part of it. Um, and, and like you said, you know, uh, marijuana will be a challenge. It has been before. So, um, you know, again, we have a very robust DRE uh, drug recognition expert program in New Jersey that's run by our state police. Um, we have about 500 uh, DREs in New Jersey. This office funds recall units in uh, 14 of our 21 counties um, so that any police officer in, in anywhere in the state really can get a DRE when they think they need one to do, a, 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 to do an exam on, on a driver that they feel uh, uh, may be under the influence of drugs. Excellent. So, you know, that that's another program we have. We'd like to get the other six counties on board, you know, this year or next um, so that there are, you know, county D, uh, recall uh, availability in, in every county in the state. Well, your data collection is going to go a long way to convincing these people why they should do it. I, yeah. I think, Christina, do we have some questions that we want to ask? Uh, uh, we do have one question come in over our social media platform. Um, have you seen a uh, decrease in impaired driving because of the pandemic, since most folks are home? So it, it, it's an interesting question to, to, to answer because 
you know, enforcement we know has been has been down during the pandemic. Um, so we have no way of really knowing how many drunk drivers are out there unless we look at the amount that have been arrested or the amount that have crashed and have been test positive tests. So, uh, you know, the data is still coming in uh, for, for, for last year as far as arrests and, and crashes. But we know we know the DWI arrests were down last year. Um, and we also know that the overall crashes, um, you know, our, our, our overall fatalities were up. Um, so th that's really the only way I can answer it right now. The data is slow in coming, uh, mm -hmm. especially from last year. Right, right. And it's still it's still very fresh, too. And, 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 so. and, and the bars are reopening at 50 percent right now. So there might be a different types of spike that's going on now. Right. Right. You know, you're right. It's hard to put causal effects together. But I think it's one of the data stuff that you're going to be looking at as you go back future as you try to get towards zero. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I want to thank exactly. you, Eric, for joining us today. I think it's been very informative. I think what we've talked about really has an impact on people's lives. I mean, a, a traffic fatality impacts friends, family, the neighborhoods. I mean, you look at any, any place where there has been a crash and there's still markers on the road or there's flowers at the, at the telephone pole. Those are the kind yeah. of constant reminders about dangers on the highway. Um, I, I don't know if we'll ever get to zero, but I know with the enforcement part, the engineering and the education part working together, we can reduce those numbers on a regular basis. I want to thank I you for your efforts and congratulate you on uh, this incredible task that you've had before you. I'll give you the chance to finish up if you want, because you've done a great job explaining some of the program Highway Traffic Safety has. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, final thoughts. I mean, I, it takes a village. Um, you know, traffic safety is about partnerships. Um, you know, it's about a lot of people and a lot of things happening you know, in, in perfect harmony, I guess. But I think the most important part is the drivers. Um, you know, that that's the most important piece in this in this safety puzzle. Um, you know, simplest way to explain it is that, you know, people need to drive like they care about each other. Um, drive like you want everyone else to drive. You know, buckle up, slow down, pay attention, and, and just drive deliberately. Um, you know, that's, that, that's it. And like I said before, failure is not an option. You know, we, we can make a difference. Um, you know, we all play a part in the reduction of, of crashes. So I would, I would direct everybody to our website, njsaferoads.com, um, you know, or to any of our social media platforms. Uh, you know, we have a fantastic uh, social media person who, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, very good information, both on our website and our social media. Yeah, and, and a lot of good resources for folks if they're interested. Thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for, for joining us. And, and as Eric said, if you do have any questions, um, DHTS has a uh, ask the director feature on Twitter. So you can ask a question and uh, it will be answered or you know, feel free to send us a question and, and we'll pass it along um, to have it answered. Uh, so thanks everyone. Um, if you'd like a copy of this recording, just let us know and we will send it to you via email. Thanks very much, everyone, and have a great day. Enjoy the sunshine Thank you. today. Thanks, Thank Christina. You. Thanks, Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Take Bill. Take care. Take care. All right.